And good morning. We're in Matthew chapter 18. If you have your Bible and want to follow along with me. We began Matthew 18 and looked at the first half. We're going to look at this next paragraph here. And this is a this is a section of scripture that is pretty straightforward. It's not um, it's not linguistically or exegetically very difficult. It's pretty easy and to understand and straightforward, but it gets a little bit more difficult and sometimes uncomfortable and maybe a little controversial when we get to the application part of it. This is a passage that gets discussed from time to time as to are we supposed to and how are we supposed to and when are we supposed to and who is supposed to. And so we're going to dive into this section, read through it, and then we'll work through what it says and what it means. And then we'll talk about, as we're doing that, we'll begin to talk about what that means for us in terms of us as individuals and us as a church body, because this is speaking to us as a body of believers. What are we supposed to do as a body of believers with the issues of sin in the lives of the other believers with us? Now, Jesus has already dealt with what we're supposed to do with sin in our own lives, hasn't he? You're supposed to cut your hands and feet off, gouge your eyes out, cut your tongue off. Okay, not literally, not literally, but figuratively, that is an exaggerated language to say we are to deal zealously with the sin in our own lives. Talking about the importance of these little ones to God the Father, that we are not to, supposed to cause them to stumble. We are not to cause one another to stumble. One of the ways we do that is to eliminate the sin in ourselves, in our own lives. We are to address that sin within us pointedly. Because the sin in my life can cause others to stumble. The sin in your life can cause others to stumble. So one of the things that we're supposed to do is deal radically or zealously with the sin within us to address that. Now comes the question of, what do we do about sin that's not in me, but in others within the body around me? How do we handle that? Do we handle that? And what is there some kind of right way or wrong way to go about doing that? And so Jesus begins to address that issue here in verse 15. And he says, if your brother sins, go and reprove him in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. But if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you, so by the so that, by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. And if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax gatherer. Truly I say to you, whatever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth about anything that they may ask, it shall be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. For where two or three have gathered together in my name, there I am in their midst. So let's stop there, <clears throat> because then Peter asks the question and we we go off on a parallel topic there, or a continuation of this topic. But let's deal with what Jesus has said here in these verses. And I'm going to deal with this kind of backwards. I'm going to deal with 18, 19, and 20 first, before we get to the, the heart of what he's talking about here. So after talking about, if your brother sins, what you should do in 15, 16, and 17, and he walks through and develops that process, if we want to call it that, 
He then says, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Binding and loosing, what is he talking about here? Because this has been interpreted and applied in a, a number of different ways, and probably most of us have heard these terms in the context of, of binding Satan and loosing things and binding sins and demons and, and things like that. It's the way it, it popularly gets talked about or used in a lot of church culture. But if we look here, there's nothing in the context about any of that. He's not talking about binding demons, demonic activity, casting out demons, these things and those are, are loosing. He's not talking about that. He brought this, you use the same terminology back in chapter 16, and he wasn't talking in the context there about demonic activity and, and binding Satan and those types of things either. What is he talking about? Well, in chapter 16, he used these same words of binding and loosing. In that context, he was talking about, he was responding to Peter's confession of Jesus as the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God. And Jesus is going to build his church. And then he's going to give the keys of the kingdom. And whatever you bind shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose shall be loosed in heaven. In that context there in chapter 16, he's talking about the building of the church on the person and the gospel of Jesus and giving the keys to the church. That is, as we present the gospel to unbelievers, that's the key for them getting into gaining access to heaven or not. If they respond in repentance, they are granted access to heaven through the gospel of Jesus Christ. If they refuse, if they reject the gospel, then they are not granted access. And so they are either bound in their sin for judgment or loosed and forgiven into the kingdom by the gospel. And in that the church is who, to the, the entity, the people to whom Jesus has entrusted the gospel, we hold the keys in that sense. Similarly, he comes to this. Now he's, in that chapter, he's dealing with presenting the gospel to those outside. Here he's talking about dealing with sin inside the church. And so as we present the word of God to those who are in sin within the church, they are given the opportunity to respond as well. If they repent, then they are loosed from their sin, they are forgiven, and they are granted fellowship within the body. If they reject the word that, that confronts their sin, then they are still bound in their sin, and they are not granted fellowship with the body. In both of these contexts, the binding and loosening has to do with the repentance or rejection by the individual, whether an unbeliever to the gospel or a believer to the word of God confronting their sin. If they repent, they are loosed from their sin. Their sins are forgiven and they are granted either access to the kingdom as a believer now or access to fellowship within the body of Christ. If they reject, they are still bound in their sin and they are outside, as it were. So the binding and loosing has to do with their response, either repentance or rejection, and then the response of the believers to that. Now, how is that, what is happening here on earth, happening in heaven? Because we are just doing exactly what God said. We are doing what Jesus told us to do, and what he said will happen if they respond if someone responds in repentance, Jesus says, they will be forgiven. They will be saved. They will be granted access to the kingdom. We are echoing here on earth what is happening in heaven when we do this properly. When we present the gospel properly and, properly and people respond, they either repent and are saved or they reject and are still bound in their trespasses and sins for judgment. Not because we set it up this way, but because Jesus said so. Jesus told us this. We are echoing what is happening in heaven. 
when a sinner, a believer who is in sin, repents of their sin and returns, they are welcomed into the fold and rejoicing occurs. When they refuse, they are left outside. And we'll get to what that looks like here in just a minute. But this is the context of binding and loosing in chapter 16 and here in chapter 18. It doesn't have anything to do with us walking around binding Satan and casting out demons and those kinds of things. There are passages that talk about casting out demons. Yes, this is not the context here. This is a very different thing. He then says... Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything that they may ask, it shall be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. For where two or three have gathered together in my name, there I am in their midst. And verse 20 gets quoted a lot for all kinds of things, for prayer meetings and all kinds of stuff. Two or three to gather, I am in their midst. That's not the context. What's the context? The context is church discipline where two or three believers are gathered because you need two or three witnesses, where two or three are gathered to confront someone, another believer in their sin and go through this process, God is in your midst and God will do according to what his word says here. If the person repents, they are welcomed into fellowship, they are forgiven. If they reject, then they are left outside. That's the context of verse 20 here. It's, it's not talking about all the other things that we tend to apply it to. Verse 19, talking about anything that we ask is in the context here of us as a body of believers asking for this to be done in the context of what verses 15, 16, and 17 are talking about. This is why context is so important, and I stress it over and over again. We need to read the verses and the phrases and the words in their context so that we can apply them appropriately and not spread them out over all these other areas and things that we want them to talk about, but they don't address. So in the context of confronting people in their sin, that's what verses 19 and 20 are said. So where two or three are gathered, in terms of doing this, God is in the midst. Because, is God in the midst of believers anywhere and everywhere that we are? Yes, we have the Holy Spirit. So it's not like we need to gather together and say, Holy Spirit, please come, because he's here. If you're here, he's here. So this verse has specific meaning for this context. So let's leave it and understand it in this context. Okay. So now, back to the top, back to verse 15. There are issues in confronting sin, are there not? Because that's what we're talking about here. If your brother or sister, this is talking about believers, fellow followers of Christ, fellow disciples, if your brother or sister, if your fellow believer is in sin, here's what you do. You confront them. Why don't we do that? Well, lots of reasons. For one, for too many believers and churches today, loving others as Jesus loves them means accepting and tolerating whatever they choose to do. That's not the biblical definition of love. That's not the love that Jesus is talking about. That's not the example that Jesus set. Because who is saying this? Jesus says, confront the other believers in their sin. And he's talking about believers. We're not talking about people outside the church, unbelievers. We're talking about believers. So let's make that clarification. We confront unbelievers with what? The gospel. You don't go to an unbeliever and say, would you please stop sinning so that we can talk about your salvation? Because that makes absolutely no sense. Because Jesus never says, please clean yourself up and stop sinning, and then I will consider offering you a salvation. No, the scripture is clear. You are dead and unable to save yourself from your sin. In the midst of that, the gospel comes. So we're not talking about unbelievers. We're talking about believers, people who are already saved and know the gospel. To those we confront, 
So we have to understand what Jesus is saying here. Jesus is saying, go and confront them. So if our understanding of the love of God and the love of Jesus is you just accept and tolerate everyone, then we're already off the reservation and we've left the Bible and we've gone somewhere else. So if that's where you are, come back here. Because Jesus says, confront the person in their sin. So that's one problem we may have to deal with today. What are other problems? Well, we don't like confrontation, most of us. There are a few. There are a few. Most of us, however, don't like confrontation. And most of us don't feel qualified to confront someone in their sin. And most of us know that we're sinners as well. So how am I going to go confront someone else in their sin? The first thing they're going to say is, well, look at your own life. So, at first, we need to correct your translation here. My translation is correct, yours may be incorrect. So let's read verse 15. If your brother sins, go and reprove him in private. That's what mine says. What does yours say? Well, here's what I think yours says. If your brother sins, go and talk to the pastor. Why do I think that? Because that's what everybody does. So if that's what yours says, you have a bad translation. Why do people come to me? Because they don't want to do it. I get that. I get that. We don't like confrontation. We don't feel qualified. We have our own problems with sin. We don't want to confront people. But what does Jesus say? Going to the pastor is down into about step three. First, he says, you go talk to the person in private. Who? You. So generally speaking, if you come to me and say, here's the issue, what am I going to tell you? First, I'm going to ask you, did you go talk to them? And if your answer is, well, no, then what are we going to talk about? You need to go talk to them. That's step one. Here, in verse 15, Jesus said this. Does that mean you have to be perfect and holy without sin? No. What did Jesus say about that? Get the log out of your own eye first. And most people stop there. Get the log out of your own eye. What does he go on to say? then you will be able to see clearly to get the speck out of your brother's eye. Which is what he's talking about here. You don't have to be perfect. You do need to be cutting off your hands and feet and gouging out your eyes. That is, you do need to be dealing zealously with your own sin issues. Yes, but you don't have to be without sin. Okay, so you go deal with this person. Now, this usually entails that you have some type of relationship with this other believer so that you have an opening to step into their life and talk to them. Now, I, said, I didn't say don't come talk to me. It is perfectly okay to come talk to someone else about this to ask for wisdom, to ask for advice, to ask for help. This is the issue, this is what I'm thinking, this is what I need to go do, what do you think? So that if you came to me and said, I've got a two by four, and I'm going to go visit so and so, and smack them with the two by four until they come around, okay, we probably need to talk about the proper application of two by fours. Perfectly okay to come talk to me or another mature believer about this carefully, So we're not moving into gossip, but you're looking for advice and help and wisdom. Perfectly okay. But your first thought needs to be, verse 15, I need to go talk to this person. How do I do that? Privately. Privately. Why privately? Because who wants to be called out for their sin in front of everybody else? It's humiliating, isn't it? 
being confronted is humiliating. Being confronted about making a mistake, doing something wrong, being confronted by another believer about sin is humiliating. But I've heard that term recently. In fact, I think I heard that back at the first part of chapter 18. Because Jesus, in answering their question about who is the greatest in the kingdom, set a child in front of them and says, unless you humble yourself like one of these, you can't even get in the door of the kingdom. We're supposed to be people of humility. So being confronted is humiliating, that's right where we should be. So when, you, when and if you are confronted by someone else in your sin, what is your response going to be? Pride. Anger. Defensiveness. Why those responses? And where are they coming from? They're coming from the flesh. They're coming from self. I'm going to protect myself. I'm going to deflect. I'm going to turn this around on you. Oh, you think I'm a sinner. Let's talk about you. Or, or denial. I didn't do this. Or whatever it might be. We've all been there. We've all experienced this. You're caught. And all these things run through your head. How do I get out of this? What did Jesus say the correct response was? Humility. Humble yourself like the one who has no power, no authority, no status, no standing. That's the correct response. That's the response that the Holy Spirit is in the back of your, all that conversation that's going on in your head is whispering. Repent. Humble yourself. That's what God is calling us to do. Why are we to confront one another in this way? Well, in the first 14 verses of this chapter, Jesus made it clear that God the Father cares about these little ones. And then in 12 and 14, he, he illustrates that with the shepherd and the sheep. The shepherd has 99 sheep and one goes missing, goes astray, or he has 100 sheep and one goes astray. He leaves the 99 and he goes after the one. He's talking here about his sheep, those who are already his. We usually apply this to the evangelism and the gospel. That's not what he's talking about here. The sheep that are already his and one goes astray, that is a believer going off into sin. What does the, what does the good shepherd do? He leaves the 99 that are safe and he goes and finds the one. And when he finds him, there is much rejoicing. Think prodigal son here. The son, who is part of the family, wanders off into sin. When he finally comes home, the father runs to greet him and throws a party. That's what God thinks about believers who stray into sin. That's what he wants. He wants to go search for them and find them and bring them back. He cares for them in that way. We should care for them in that way. We should care for one another in this same way. So when we see a brother or sister wandering off into sin, what should we do? We should go get them and try to bring them back. That's what this process is talking about. Oftentimes when we talk about this process as a church, we get on the wrong side of it. We approach this as... Do we as a church engage in, do we follow the practice of church discipline so that we can bring judgment and fire and wrath down upon people? That's not what this process is for. What's the purpose? The purpose is for repentance and reconciliation and rejoicing. That's the purpose. To go find that sheep that has gone astray and bring it back so that we can rejoice together. That's the purpose. It is when they refuse to repent that the other steps become necessary. But the purpose is restoration. Because God cares for them like the one lost lamb. 
and we should as well. So we are to confront because we are loving people the way God loves them. We're to do this because a little bit of leaven leavens the whole lump, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5. That is, if you have a whole lump of dough and you put a little pinch of yeast in it, what happens? It affects and infects the entire dough, and it all begins to rise. If you own a house, how many termites do you want to see? Well, they're just one or two over here and this side over here. It's okay. That's not the way we respond, is it? No, because we know what damage is going on if we see one or two. There's potential damage that can bring down the whole house eventually if we leave it and just let it continue. Sin does the same thing to the body of Christ. And it needs to be removed. And we should do this because we desire fellowship with God. And we desire fellowship with God's people, with one another. And then we should do this because Jesus told us to. So we've talked about who we are confronting. We've talked about why we're confronting. We've talked about the purpose of the confrontation to bring about reconciliation and rejoicing. What are we to confront? We're to confront issues of sin. Issues of sin. Not issues of opinion. And we dealt with that a little bit last week. In verses 1 to 14. And we looked over in Romans 14 and Romans 15. Where Paul talks about, you have this opinion, I have that opinion, they're all okay. We're not talking about confronting people over opinions and disagreements over those kinds of things. We're talking about issues of sin. If it's issues of opinions and things like that, we can deal with that in other ways. Issues of sin, we need to confront in this way. So if your brother or sister sins, go and reprove him in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother or sister. If he listens, he or she repents. If they recognize, yes, this is sin and I need to deal with this, then we help them in that process. It may be one conversation. It may require multiple conversations. It may be an ongoing process. But the purpose is to bring them out of sin and back into obedience and back into fellowship with the Lord and with one another. So we do this privately at first. If they don't listen, then we go to the next step. Verse 16. Then you take one or two more with you, so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses every fact may be confirmed. Then you take someone else with you who can help. You take someone else who you bring in, who either knows about this or you bring them into this and explain the situation, and you go and confront again. Here is the issue of sin. Here's what we are seeing. Which is why you go do it privately at first, because you could be wrong. You could have completely misunderstood the situation. And it may not be sin. You may just have completely misunderstood everything. And it gives them an opportunity to explain and not embarrass either one of you. But assuming that there is a sin issue, you go confront the person. And they refuse to listen to you. Or they refuse to change. They refuse to repent. They refuse to acknowledge that it is sin. Whatever their reasoning may be, so you get someone else, one or two others, and you go back and confront them. This time, all three of us agree that this, we're all in agreement this is what's going on, and we're all in agreement that this is sin. Hopefully, at this point, they repent. And if they do, 
They are forgiven. There's much rejoicing and fellowship together. But, verse 17, if he refuses to listen to the two or three, then tell it to the church. So the next step is then you go to the church leadership. And tell them, this is what's, what's happened, this is what we're aware of, this is what we have done. What is our next step? And then the church leadership or the church as a whole, just it, and it depends on the circumstances, gets involved. And so if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax gatherer. A Gentile and a tax gatherer, what are these? These are people who are outside of the fellowship of the body. Now Jesus is speaking here to a Jewish audience, which is why he uses these words. For Jews who were inside as the children of Abraham, Gentiles were on the outside. Tax gatherers were Jews who worked for the Romans, gathering taxes against their own Jewish people to give to the Gentiles, and so they were cast out as well. So they are not allowed fellowship. They can't come eat at the table with the Jews at this time. So how do we understand this then as the church? Well, as the body of believers who fellowship together, who worship together, if we have someone in our midst who is in some kind of blatant sin and this process has gone through and it gets to the point the church intervenes and they refuse to repent, then we treat them as an outsider, as a Gentile or a tax gatherer. Now what does that mean? Well, that can mean a number of different things depending upon the particular circumstances. There's some room here, depending on the particulars of the circumstance, that would require us handling it slightly differently. For example, in some instances, those outside, you didn't talk to them. But we know that Jesus went and met with Gentiles and tax gatherers to present the gospel to them. So there's some leeway here depending on the particulars of the circumstance. And the rest of the New Testament speaks of some of these. And so let's look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run us through some of these uh, just to give us some examples here. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. In 1 Corinthians 5, Paul writing this letter responding to things that are going on there in the church in Corinth he has been made aware of a particular circumstance. So in verse, chapter 5, verse 1, it is reported that there is immorality among you, an immorality of such a kind as does not exist even among the Gentiles, that someone has his father's wife. And you've become arrogant and have not mourned. Instead, in order that one who has done this deed might be removed from your midst. So he's engaged in this sin. Everyone, including Paul, is aware of it. And they haven't done anything. He's just, they're a part of the church from week to week, day to day, whatever they're doing. For I, on my part, though absent in body, but present in spirit, have already judged him who has so committed this as though I were present. And as Paul isn't there personally in presence, but this is what he wants them to do. In the name of our Lord Jesus, when you are assembled, and I with you in spirit, with the power of the Lord Jesus, Deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Now that sounds pretty harsh. And, and he's being harsh. He's being very, very blunt in what he's saying here. But you should kick this one out of your fellowship. Why? so that he may be condemned and judged and forgotten about it. No. So that he can be judged, and hopefully in that will come to a place of repentance. He can be shamed and hopefully realize what he has done and come to a place of repentance and come back and may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. 
For as for you, the rest of you, your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough? Clean out the old leaven that you may be a new lump. I wrote, verse 9, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with immoral people. I did not at all mean with the immoral people of this world or with the covetous and swindlers or idolaters, for then you would have to go out of the world. So he's not talking here about unbelievers. Don't associate with immoral people. I don't mean the unbelievers. I'm talking about immoral people in the church. I wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother or sister if he or she should be an immoral person or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or drunkard or swindler, not to even eat with such a one. We don't judge the people outside. We judge the people inside the church. This is what Paul is talking about. So Paul here has an example of Matthew 18, 15, 16, and 17. You should not be watching this continued sin go on in the life of this man and do nothing about it. You need to confront that sin, and if he refuses to repent, remove him from your fellowship. He should not be eating with you until he repents. If we were to go over to First Corinthians, or Second Corinthians chapter 2, uh, it's about verses 6 through 11 or so. Paul seems to be talking about this guy. He has repented. Now he said, Paul says, let him back in. He's repented. Welcome him back. If you keep punishing him and keep him on the outside, Satan's going to cause all kinds of problems for you, both him and for you. If he's repented, welcome him back in. Forgive him. So, the other side of this is presented there. Some other New Testament examples. Second John. Chapter, um, well, there's only one chapter. So verses 10 and 11. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, that is, if they bring a false gospel or false teaching, do not receive him into your home and do not give him a greeting. For the one who gives him a greeting participates in his evil deeds. That is, if it's a believer or they claim to be a believer, and they have the wrong gospel, if they're engaged in false teaching, don't associate with them, don't listen to them, kick them out. Because it's someone who is teaching the wrong gospel, you should not associate with them, period. Don't eat with them, don't give them a greeting. Titus 3.10, reject a factious man after a first and second warning. This is a shortened version of what Jesus is talking about here. You've got, you've got a guy in the church who is causing division. What do you do? You confront him a first and a second time. If he refuses to listen, if he refuses to stop, if he refuses to repent, then you reject him. He's causing division in the church. We looked at 1 Corinthians, uh, 2 Thessalonians. Let me turn over there real quick. He says, Now we command you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep aloof from every brother who leads an unruly life and not according to the tradition which you received from us. This is the command from Christ. Where does he get that idea? From Matthew 18. To keep aloof from every brother who leads an unruly life. Now this is not talking about the guy sinned one time. What does it say? Who leads an unruly life. He continues to lead a life of sin. He is in his sin and he refuses to come out of that. He's not working on it. He's comfortable in that life of sin, whatever that might be. Keep aloof from him. There needs to be a degree of separation there from him. Later on in the chapter, he says, If anyone does not obey our instruction in this letter, take special note of that man and do not associate with him so that he may be put to shame. And this idea of putting him to shame is the same idea that's in these other passages as well. What's the point? To bring about repentance. So by our actions, we are to bring to light 
the sin in a way that shames that person, hopefully they will then come to repentance. We're not to tolerate their sin. We're not to overlook their sin. We're to confront it in such a way that they are ashamed of their sin and hopefully will come to repentance. And yet, do not regard him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. And Paul gives us some helpful information here. Why do we not regard them as an enemy? And this is where we need to be careful that in confronting sin, we don't move over from what we're supposed to be doing too far in the other direction. Our job and our responsibility in confronting another believer in sin is not to condemn them under the weight of God's judgment as we are sitting over here holy and pristine without any blemish of sin casting dispersions and judgment upon them and condemnation. That's not the idea here. We're not to treat them as an enemy. We're to approach them as a brother or sister in Christ. We're to approach them as one who knows well the frailty and sinfulness of ourselves, but who notices there's a sin issue here. You need to deal with this. Let me help you. As your brother, your sister in Christ, let me help you. Because I can't sit here and watch you do this and just ignore it and pretend that everything's okay. But not as an enemy, as a brother, as a sister. We come alongside, we are admonishing, there should be shame. And if they refuse, we may have to separate from them to one degree or another. We may have to remain aloof from them. We may not be able to eat and fellowship with them. But the purpose is as a brother or sister, not as an enemy. Jude kind of sums all of this up. Have mercy on some who are doubting. There are some who are just struggling with doubts, struggling with trying to figure this out. Have mercy on them. Have compassion on them. Come alongside them. They're a lamb that is wandering off from the herd, going astray. Go bring them back. Save others, snatching them out of the fire. There are some who are not just kind of wandering, they're, trying, they're heading off the cliff as fast as they can. Go get them. Stop them. Lasso them. Pull them back. Snatching them away from the fire. They're, getting, they're, they're heading toward destruction. Stop them. Now again, how they respond is not within our purview. They respond the way they respond. What is our responsibility? Go get them. Go try. And on some have mercy with fear, hating even the garments polluted by the flesh. That is, some, like moving back to 1 Corinthians 5, some are involved in some serious sin issues, and we need to confront that head on. And there's no nice way of going about it. And we don't, we need to be careful we don't get embroiled in sin as well. We're hating the sin. But we're reaching out with the love of God to the one in the sin, trying to throw them a lifeline. So some of, some of the sin issues may be very involved and very serious and need to be treated as such. So there is, there's some, 
depending on the circumstances, depending on the sin and the involvement and things going on, there's, a, there's some degrees of how we treat them, how we respond to them if they refuse. But there needs to be some kind of separation, some type of, acknowledge, some type of acknowledgement that you are now not welcome here in our fellowship as believers because you refuse to repent of this ongoing sin in your life. Now, we'll deal with, Peter's going to ask the question, okay, well, how, much, how often do we offer forgiveness and those kinds of things? We'll deal with that next week. Right now, this is, this is where we are. If there's continual sin, if there's an ongoing lifestyle issue of sin, if there's that kind of thing going on, that needs to be confronted. In this, in this way. First, when you become aware of this, you have some type of relationship with the person, you go talk to them. Because again, you could be wrong. You could just be misunderstanding what, you're, what you think is happening and it's not an issue of sin. If so, great. Sorry, I was wrong. I apologize. But if it is actually an issue of sin, hopefully they respond in repentance. That needs to be the goal, so we need to go into the conversation with that mindset. As a brother or sister in Christ, I want to come talk to you about this. I want to understand this, and I want to help. If they refuse, then you find some other mature believers who can go with you. If they still refuse, then you go to the leadership of the church and the church begins to get involved. Again, oftentimes it doesn't go very smoothly. There are more than one conversation, but this is the general outline of what happens. Oftentimes, what happens when we do this as a church? Unfortunately, especially because of the situation that we are in here with churches all around us, when confronted with sin the person leaves this church and goes down the street and finds another church. There's not a lot we can do about that. I did have, I remember one, there was a man I became aware of, the situation, he was, it's not this church, it was a different church, so everybody can relax. Um, but there was a serious accusation against this man of, of, of an ongoing sin issue. And so I, I felt I needed to get involved, so I contacted him, and he, he wouldn't call me back, wouldn't call me back, wouldn't call me back. So finally, it, I drove to his house at 4 o'clock in the morning because I knew he got up early and went to work early. I didn't know what time he was going to leave, and I just blocked his driveway until he came out to go to work. I said, we need to talk. We can do it here or we can do it in my office. Uh, so he said, okay. And so we went and talked, and sure enough, it was true, and, and so forth. And so we talked about it, and he, he said, well, I'll, I'll get back to you. And so I followed up with him later. He was not going to repent. He was going to continue doing what he was doing. And so I, you, you can't come to the church then. I'll be happy to keep meeting with you and keep talking with you, but... You can't come to the, to the worship service. You can't come to the Sunday school class. You can't do that. It, he understood. Uh, two weeks later, I found out he was attending a church across town. And then I heard that he was going to be a Sunday school teacher in that church. And that's when I called the church over there and said, I'm just going to let you know why he's there and what's happening and then you all can handle it however you want to. But that's often what happens. People leave the church, and they just move on somewhere else, rather than dealing with the issue. I bring that up to say, to bring up two things. One, if you are confronted, please don't run. Please don't run. I know it's hard. I know it's embarrassing. I know it's shameful. I know it hurts. I know your pride wells up. Mine does too. I don't want to be confronted. I don't want you to know my sin. But running doesn't solve the issue, doesn't bring us closer to Christ. Hopefully we don't have that kind of problem. But if 
confronted by someone because of your sin. Please don't run. Two, when people do run, when they leave and they go somewhere else, we've done what we were supposed to do. We confronted them. We can't always fix it. We're not, we're not in charge of how they respond. We can continue to follow up as best we can, but they are responsible to their own Lord. And before him, they will stand or fall. So, again, not a fun topic, but a fairly straightforward one. So what have we learned here about sin in this chapter, both halves of this chapter so far that we've looked at? One, we need to personally, zealously confront the sin in ourselves. We don't need to chop off body parts, but that's the kind of zealousness that is required to deal with the sin in ourselves. And then secondly, we need to deal with the sin in one another. That is the ongoing, unrepentant sin. We all have little sins here and there that we repent of, whatever. But if there's an ongoing sin, if there's an unforgiven sin, if there's something that hasn't been repented about, if they've sinned against you, we need to deal with those in this fashion. Go to them privately. And then work your way through the process. Hopefully, there is repentance. We need to go to them with that mentality. As a brother or sister, I love you as Christ does. I want to see restoration in your life. Let me help you come to a place of repentance. Let me help you deal with the issue of sin. Sin, apparently, is a big deal to God. Now, how would we come to this idea? Because he seems to be dealing with it very seriously all throughout Scripture, doesn't he? So much so that he sent his only son to die to take care of the issue of sin in you and me. So let me pray for us this morning. Father, we thank you for, again, for your word, which gives us this clear guidance of dealing with the issue of sin in our midst as the body of Christ. Father, we don't like dealing with our own sin. We certainly don't want to have to get involved in the sin in the lives of others. But we're reminded here of how much you love each one of us. You love us too much to leave us there with those issues of sin. So you've given us your word and you've given us your Holy Spirit and you've given us one another to deal with those issues, to confront us, to admonish us, to exhort us, to edify us, to come alongside us, so that we might be filled with the Spirit and not carry out the desires of the flesh. We need one another for this process. It is far too easy to come here this morning and leave and go be alone and go right back into our sin. We need one another. So we pray that you would give us the wisdom and the courage and the discipline to deal with our own sin and to help others deal with theirs as well. That you might be glorified in us as individuals, as families, and as a body of believers here. As we are sanctified by your word and by your spirit. In love for you and in love for one another. Amen.